It is uh, always interesting to talk about Christmas because you can only use so many stories. You can only use so many passages. But today, I'd like to, to visit that story through a different lens. And I'd like to show you uh, a, a couple of places that caught my attention during, during these last few days. The first one, this is an assuming door is the entrance of the core. The core is a club in New York City. But as an assuming and as simple as that door appears to be, to be a member of this club, you must pay an entrance fee of $50,000 and a yearly fee of $15,000. Um, so not anybody can be part of this club. Some of the members of this club are CEO of Yahoo, Jerry Yang, Roger Waters, Pink Floyd, and the fashion designer Kenneth Cole. This is a pi the picture of another, of another club. Of another club. <laughs> this is a Cercle de Lorraine club in Brussels, Belgium. This club is not as expensive as the circle, as, uh, as the core, I'm sorry. Um, it's only 1,750 euros to be part of this club and a monthly fee of 1,507 euros. But, but, to be part of it, there's a winning list of five years. I'm going to show you another club, and this is a Hurlingham club. This club is a, a more exclusive club, the most exclusive club in London. And uh, this club, uh, it is said that King Edward VII went there to shoot pigeons. So when you go to this club, when you're a member of this club, you are sure to, to rub elbows with uh, people of the royalty and celebrities in England. However, the entrance fees are undisclosed. And there is a waiting list to be part of this club of 15 years to become a non-voting member. And once you become a member and after 15 years, then you can become a voting member. Now, knowing this about these exclusive places and clubs that people with means and names try to become part of, I'd like to ask a question. What are the requirements to be part of the club that Jesus called us to be part of? That is why we begin today this series that we title, The Gift of Love. Now, I have to, to make a couple of disclosures here. See, on Christmas... As Christians, as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't celebrate the date. We don't celebrate December 25th. It happens that it was the day chosen to be appointed as the day that Jesus was born. But historians and theologians have agreed that that is most likely not the day that in which Jesus was born. So we don't really celebrate the day, the date. We celebrate the event. And the event is the, the fact, the reality, that Jesus came to this earth to be born as the king who became a man so that man could become king. Having said that, it is our intention with this series to discover what are the characteristics that God seeks for in those he calls to be in. So for that, let's go to our notes that, that appear on your, on your bulletins. Or let's go to our Bibles in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 8. I'm reading today from the New Living Translation. And it says on the, on the first part of verse 8, that night. And let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. That night. Which night are we talking about? The night of the birth of Jesus. 
So we know one thing, that Jesus was not born during the day. He was born at night. And this is quite symbolic and interesting because, see, it is in our darkest nights that Jesus is promised to come and give us his light. So on that night, it says, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. There were shepherds. The whole Bible tells us stories of shepherds. Abraham was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Isaac was a shepherd. Jacob was a shepherd. And of course, the most famous of all, David was a shepherd. In fact, in the Bible we find uh, uh, verses that say that God calls himself a shepherd. Unfortunately, in the Old Testament, shepherds had a bad reputation. And I guess if you were a shepherd, it was bad reputation. <laughs> uh, I, it was right there. I had to. I had to. It was right there. So, so shepherds had a bad reputation in the Old Testament. And unfortunately, that bad reputation did not end in the New Testament. So when Jesus is born, shepherds still are known as people that were the lowest class. In fact, there were only one level above leopards. The Talmud says, regarding providing help for people in need, it says, no help has to be given to either pagans or shepherds. So when we look at this event, and, and we see God choosing shepherds to come to the birth of Jesus and celebrate that first Christmas, it was really an unusual election by God of having shepherds being the first to receive the news. Because of their work, they were ceremonially impure. The constant movement that they had looking for green pastures for their flocks caused them to be disconnected from society and, and pretty much forgotten. People distrusted them. In fact, they had the reputation of being thieves. Their witness in court was not allowed. You know, the Bible says that... that it, in court, the witness of two or three people were needed, but if they were shepherds, didn't count. They were known as vulgar and lacking manners. So these were not the people that you would invite to have dinner with you on a special night. And when I, when I read this about the shepherds and that first Christmas, it came to my head another bird. And let me show you a birth certificate. I don't know if you can read it, but let me help you. It says, Westminster, on the top, that's the place, on the 22nd of July, 2013, at St. Mary's Hospital. And then it says the name on line two, His Royal Highness, Prince George, Alexander Louise of Cambridge. You know whose birth certificate that belongs to? It's the son of Prince John, William, William, and Kate. Now, can you imagine that at the day they took the family portrait, next to them are homeless people and trash collectors? That is exactly what happened on that Christmas night when Jesus, on his birth, his father invited the lowest class of people to be part of that portrait. And you've seen it. We have one outside. Not that portrait, but they bent. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 12, this is in your notes. This is, this is what Jesus said. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Verse 13. For I have come to call not those who think they are neighbors, 
I mean righteous, sorry, but those who know they are sinners. Jesus came to seek what was lost. And what was lost was people to sin. Now, there are a couple of obstacles. Because see, the lost needs to know, needs to be aware that is lost. And second, the lost needs to want not to be lost anymore. If I understand that because of my human nature, I am a sinner, my greatest need is to look for Jesus. So what is it? What is the attitude? What do I need to find Jesus? The first attitude that I'd like to suggest to you is that I need to be attentive. And if you're taking notes, this is the first thing you write. I need to be attentive. Let's go back to verse 8, Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says that these shepherds on that night, they were doing something. You know what it says they were doing? They were guarding their flocks. They were attentive to their flock. They were performing a task that require their attention because the moment the shepherds would fall asleep their flocks would would fall prey to wild animals now in spite of their reputation as shepherds these shepherds were not lazy they were not watching tv or playing video games these shepherds were attentive and in spite of the disconnect from society, these shepherds were connected to their task. They were connected to their duty. Perhaps you've thought at some point in your life, I don't matter to God. I've made too many mistakes. I'm not worthy. But let me tell you something. You are as special as to God as any other person is. Because the gift of love is for everyone. We were made in His likeness, in His image. So for that and for God, we all deserve to hear His good news. I was in Bethlehem last month. It sounds kind of weird, right? I was in Bethlehem last month. Sounds like I was around the corner, yeah. I was in Bethlehem last month, and uh, I got a chance to be in one of the caves where the shepherds that were in the fields that night used to be. And this is how the caves look like. See, shepherds did not leave, did not live at home. They left their caves to go to the fields and to take care of the sheep, of their flocks. In fact, when they went into the cave, their animals went in with them. You see that there's a stairway right there on the, on the right side, on the left side, your left side. And uh, this staircase was designed for the shepherds to come down. But there's a small gate, ga exit on the side. That's where the animals went in and out of the cave. So when the shepherds slept, they slept with their animals. This is kind of uh, their furniture. And you see there inside, there's more rooms. So this was a mansion for the shepherds. This is actually one of the places where these shepherds in Bethlehem lived at the time that they received the call. But the crazy thing is this. When they were called, they were not in the cave. Where were they? In the fields, they were doing their job. They were attentive. They were not sleeping. Now, the second attitude that, that, that we need to, to, to experience when we are seeking for Jesus is that we need to be humble. Humble. Verse 9, Luke chapter 2. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were 
terrified, wouldn't you? It appears that in the Bible, every time an angel appears to someone, that person is just terrified. It's just amazing to think that in the presence of a heavenly creature, of a heavenly being, as humans, we fear. And that's not even the presence of God. It's just the presence of an angel. But there's something about this. Because if the first reaction is fear, what dictates their direction, what they're going to do, their reaction to this fear is what matters the most. And there's two ways that we can act when we have fear in the presence of God. One is to hide. The second is to worship. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because at the end of the story, when Jesus returns to earth, those two reactions are going to be the reactions that the people on earth will have. Either they will hide and they will cry to the rocks to fall on them because they do not want to be face to face with Jesus. Or second, to worship. What was the reaction that these shepherds had? Now, let's bring it to, to our terms, to our human terms. If you work for someone, you work at a company, you work uh, with a boss, how do you feel when you get the message saying your boss wants to talk to you in his office? Okay. You're a student. You're in high school. How is it when somebody comes to your classroom and they knock on the door and the teacher hears this message? And everybody hears it actually because somebody comes with a message saying such and such needs to go to the office. The principal wants to talk to him or her. How do you react to that? Okay. You don't work for a boss. You don't go to school. How do you feel when you're driving on the freeway and you see color lights behind you and they tell you pull over? How do you react to that? You know, you know that even if you're not guilty of anything, you feel guilty. You feel guilty. You don't know. What did I do now? You walk to the office worried. What is he going to say now? What did I do? Because in our nature... We are sinners. We know that the moment there is an opportunity for accountability, there's something that we worry about. That is the fear that any human experience when we come to meet Jesus. There's a, a, a story about the house where... Beethoven, the, the, the musician, used to live in Bonn in, in Germany. And the story, uh, his house, after he passed away, became a museum. And, and, and uh, people would go to his house and see his books and, and some of his music. But there, in a corner of a room, there was his piano. And in this story, there was a young woman who visited the house, sat at the piano, and being a trained, a trained pianist, began to play the piano. But one of the people who was guarding the house realized that one of those visitors on, to the house on that day was none other than Jan Pederowski, a Polish pianist. Well known. So he told this girl, you know, maybe you should let the master play the piano. So... This young girl got up from the piano, uh, well, not from the piano, from the bench at the piano. And, and when she got up, she told Pedrowski, could you please play? The story says that when the master received the invitation, he said, I am not worthy of playing the real master's piano.
God is looking for people who understand that what they need is to be at the feet of the master. And that only happens when we experience humility. You remember that one day Jesus was at the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And as he is there, Martha is busy in the kitchen. She is cooking. She's preparing stuff, refreshments, dinner. She, she proud herself on being a good host. And Jesus walks in the kitchen for some reason. And Martha is busy. She is on target. She is on a mission. And it strikes a conversation with, with Martha. And Jesus asks, what's going on? She said, Martha, I mean Jesus, you, you have to do something. See, you know, I'm busy here. I'm, I'm, I'm working in the kitchen and trying to offer the best refreshments for the people, for you, for the disciples, for everybody here. And look at my sister Mary. She's just there. Where was Mary at? At the feet of Jesus. Crazy thing, because every time we find Mary, Mary is at the feet of Jesus. Since the moment she poured the perfume at Jesus' feet, at the house listening to Jesus at his feet, and at the cross, Mary is at Jesus' feet. Because Mary understood, understood one thing, that she was lost and Jesus found her. And the only place to be was to be humble enough that the best place for her to be was at the feet of Jesus. The next attitude that we need to experience is that we need to accept our part. Verse 10. But the angel reassured them, this is talking to the shepherds, don't be afraid. Now every time an angel appears, every time uh, appears a, 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 a human being, the Men fear, but there is this fear always is followed by the words, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. He said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The beauty of the gospel family is that it's not only for the worthy. It's not for the perfect. It's not only for those who go to church. It's not only for those who know the lingo. It's for everyone. Good news for all the people. Now, this is quite interesting. Because you see here in this version that we're reading today, it says good news. But in the Greek, the original text from this verse, it says evangelion. Evangelion. Does that sound familiar? Like evangelistic when we have an evangelistic series evangelistic crusade somebody who preaches the gospel is an evangelist now let me tell you something about this back in the days when the cities were surrounded by walls protected by walls and and, and the armies went to war out in the field away from the palace at the end of every battle there was a messenger, a messenger that would come back to the palace, to the city, before the king, if he was not in battle. And this messenger would come back with the news, either good news or bad news. If this messenger was bringing bad news because in the battlefield things didn't go so well, this messenger fear that by bringing the bad news before the king, the king might kill him. Because it was understood that nobody can bring bad news to a king. Therefore, the saying, don't kill the messenger. But it was the other part too. When there were good news from the battlefield. And, and in the battlefield, the victory was won. This messenger will come hastily on his horse, racing to the city, racing inside, and before the gates were open, he'll be screaming, Evangelion, Evangelion, Evangelion. Because they were? Are you awake this morning? Because they were? 
you lied to me. You're not awake. So once the gates were open, this person, this messenger would come into the palace and through the streets all the way to the chamber where the king was saying, Evangelion, Evangelion, Evangelion. Because they were... Is that how you celebrate Christmas? So it was good news because the victory was won. Guess what the angel said to the shepherds? Evangelion. These are good news. If you're a shepherd who has nothing, who in the culture deserves nothing, they were great news. If today you are a sinner, those are great news because the battle has already been won. Now, verse 11. These are the news. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord. Remember that everybody in the time before Jesus was born we're expecting for the Messiah. In fact, still in Israel, some Jews expecting the Messiah to be born. Has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you. Notice that it, say, notice that it doesn't say, and some people, and only worthy people. No, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of clothes, lying in a manger. Wait, you said the Messiah? In a manger? A baby? You gotta be joking. Suddenly, verse 13, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned, verse 15, to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, pay attention to this. This is what the shepherds did. This is their reaction after the message, after they saw the angel, and not only the angel, but the heavenly host. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. First thing that we need to note is, God understands their fear and tells them, don't fear, don't panic. This is a message of peace. Isn't it true that our first reaction to things that we cannot understand, that we cannot control this fear, because we don't know what is going to happen next? Our first reaction is fear. When, when there's uh, economic news, when, 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 when loss of a job, loss of a loved one, when, when situation changes, when, when we turn on the news every afternoon for God's sake. We fear. It's amazing how many texts, how many messages, how many emails I get when there's something developing in the world. Pastor, does this have to do with the end? Because we fear. Oftentimes I wonder, are they telling me this because they really want to go with Jesus now or because they're panicking that they're not, no longer going to be on earth? Because our reaction to things that we cannot control, to things that we cannot understand, is fear. But the message of the gospel family is peace, not fear. Second thing that we got to understand from this experience with the shepherds is that this is a message with a sign. There is a clue. You will recognize Him. You will identify Him. You will know who He is. God is not a mystery. God is not a secret. The experience with Jesus is not something that you need to go on a hunt like the Da Vinci Code. The experience with Jesus is something open, out there. Now, the crazy thing about this is that, you see, when we study prophecy, prophecy is not the thing. Prophecy is the thing that points to the thing. Are you breathing? Oftentimes, I'm, I worry that we're more concerned about prophecy 
the sign than the actual thing that the prophet is pointing to, which is Jesus. The angels received a sign. You will find him in a manger. And the third, the message is for all people, but, but it requires a personal response. You. You. So even though the message of the good news is for everyone, it requires a personal response. Because see, as, as much as my mom and my dad are good people, I have to respond for myself. I am the one that needs to go to Jesus. I have to make that decision. Paul speaks a little bit about this in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. 2, it says, therefore, we never stop talking, I mean, we never stop thanking God that when you received this message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what was said and the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Let's go to the next level. The shepherds not only accepted the message, they acted on it. And they not just acted, they acted quickly. Verse 16, Luke chapter 2, look at your notes. They hurried to where? To the village. They were in the fields. They get the encounter with the, mess, with the angels. The angels tell them about the sign where Jesus was in the manger. Remember, there was no room in the inn. So they were not in, they were out. You're slow today, my goodness. So now, they decide to go. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. There was the baby. Okay, just look at this from another angle. What are the odds that there's going to be a baby in a manger? Just, just what are the odds? So the fact that there was a baby in the manger, that was a confirmation that what the angels told them was true. It was a miracle on itself. It was a miracle on itself that the shepherds went. Because, and they went quickly. Because these shepherds not, were not known by doing things quickly. It was like, clean your room. Yeah, I'll do it right now. I'm not saying any names. They could have said, okay, you know, we'll go, we'll go, but you know, uh, maybe in the morning, maybe later. Maybe when the weather is a little warmer. When, when the moment is right. You know, I go when I truly feel it. You've heard that one before? You know, I go when I, when I have some issues that I need to take care of first. Then when I take care of those issues, then I go. They went quickly. Corrie Ten Boom, you, probably you've read books from her or, or her, maybe listened to some of her messages. She, she said about this story, she says, if Jesus had been born in Bethlehem a thousand times, a thousand times, but not once in my heart, I would still be lost. Jesus had already been born. The message had been given. But for the shepherds, Jesus was not a reality until they decided to act and act quickly. And the last attitude, family, is that they decided to share their experience. Verse 17. After seeing him, so now they're in front of Jesus. They're there at the manger the shepherds told everyone what had happened. What? Remember, the shepherds, they, they were not social people. They were not so socially accepted. They were outcasts. They live away, disconnected from society. But now as they're coming back, anybody who they find on the way, they tell them, hey, 
the angels came. They told us about the Messiah being born. We came. There he was. Verse 18. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. Verse 20. The shepherds went back to their flocks. Wait. They left the flocks? Are you with me? What was more important for the shepherds? To obey the heavenly command or to continue on their earthly task? That is just amazing. But I, there's a lesson we have to learn there. Because they were attentive. They were responsible on their earthly task. They were obedient to the heavenly command. Let me say that again, just in case it's too late in the morning. Because they were attentive on their earthly task, they were obedient to their heavenly command. Let me translate that. If you're lazy, you never get it. You have to be doing something. You cannot be sitting waiting for it to happen. I pray, I pray that none of you comes to church to sit in church. I pray that none of you ever say, this is my seat. I pray that all of you get to say, this is my ministry. This is where I serve. This is where I'm involved. This is the people I help. This is the people I serve. This is the people I ministry to. Because the moment that you sit, you lost the message of good news already. Verse 20, the shepherds went back to their flocks glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. What did they do? They worship. Two reactions when we encounter God. Fear or worship. The shepherds decided to worship. I wish I had a more recent story about what I'm about to tell you, but unfortunately this is the most recent one. Back in 1988, The Dodgers won the World Series. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, don't tell me. Don't remind me. But there's something about this story that I'm going to tell you that is very powerful to me. Oral Hershiser, you know, was the MVP of the, of, of the World Series. He pitched two games, and, and he, he did an amazing job. But that was not as important what he did on the field as what, as what he did two nights before on the 22nd of October in 1998. He was invited to be part of the Johnny Carson show. And as he is sitting there, you know, Johnny had this ability to, to, to poke into the guests to answer questions that they didn't want to answer. So Oral Hershey said, is sitting there on the couch and Johnny asked him a question. Oral. Right before you went out to pitch on the last inning, you were standing on the side of the dugout alone. The camera zoomed on you. There was a close-up on your face. And your lips were moving. But there was nobody around you. What were you saying? Who were you talking to? Oral said, well, I wasn't really talking to anybody. What were you saying? And Earl said, well, I was singing a song. You were singing a song at the most important moment of your baseball career, you were singing a song? Yeah, I was singing a song. What song was that? that well, I'm not a singer. Uh, sing it. No, no, I'm not a singer. I'm not going to sing it. Sing it. Sing it for us, please. Sing it. 
And you know, Johnny involved the crowd, and now the whole audience is saying, sing it, sing it, sing it. So her shyster, her shyster take a, takes a deep breath and begins to sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That is exactly what He sang. In the moment that required his most intense attention, he decided to worship. Why don't we stand? And why don't we sing this song together as we worship the one who gave us the gift, the gift of love. Father, as we worship your name, as we thank you for the gift of Jesus, as we thank you for the great news that you have given us to experience, Father, we pray that the attitudes that you find in our hearts are the attitudes of people who acknowledge that we need something more than life on this earth, that we acknowledge that we are sinners and what we need is a Savior. May we today Hasting, come to the manger. And may Jesus be born in our hearts today. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.